thanks again for joining. Uh, I will start for today with um, some uh, conceptual um, uh, details, and then we will also have some live coding and some um, uh, some animations that will help you grasp uh, the concepts uh, regarding uh, neural networks. Uh, please be also prepared with your microphone. I I invite you at some point to uh, play a small game with me. So on today's agenda, we will embark on this exciting journey uh, into the world of the neural networks. We'll start uh, from the basics and we'll build our way up. So first we'll delve into the concept of learning. What does it mean for a machine to learn? And uh, how is this familiar or how is this similar uh, or different with human learning? So these are some questions that we are going to explore. Uh, we'll then dive into the fundamental unit of the neural network, which is the neuron itself. So just a neuron in our brain, uh, just as neurons in our brains uh, process information, artificial neurons in neural network play a crucial role uh, in processing data. So once we grasp the concept of one single neuron, we will scale up and uh, and we will see how these neurons come together from uh, to form to form on uh, a network so uh we'll discuss the architecture we'll discuss the, the layer of uh, the neural network and how data uh, flows through through the networks so uh then later moving to the practical side we'll begin by coding a single neuron this will give us a hands-on understanding uh, on its working uh, and next, we'll expand uh, the single neuron into a full-blown neural network. So we'll code the structure, we'll define the connections uh, between the neurons, uh, and we, we'll set it up for uh, for the training. Um, probably the last 30 minutes will be for questions and answers, but we can also do some interactive things. We can uh, we can do some more coding if you if you want. It depends on uh, on um, uh, your questions mostly. Uh, yeah, and finally, after after we will be training the um, uh, our network. Uh, uh, we'll test this uh, neural network against some new data sets and we'll see how well it performs, how well it did it learn, right? We'll also do some uh, visualizing, uh, which will give us insight. Sorry? Oh, okay. Uh, so th this will, 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 uh, will give us some insights on um, yeah, how it's going with millions. Uh, Irina, please confirm if you can uh, clearly hear me. Uh, yes, hear I can hear, hear you well. Thank you so much. Okay, so by the end of the session, you will have like hopefully a solid uh, fundamental understanding on the neural networks and some hands-on experience because I'm going to deliver you the, the code and that we are working on uh, today. Uh, coding language, someone is asking, uh, is it Java? Um, yes, it's Java, but we also have a JavaScript part and also have a Python part. So I'll show you in a few, in a few moments. Okay. Let's see first, uh, let, let's discuss first like, some, some basic concepts about neural networks. So well, we probably know uh, that, uh, human brain contains about 86 billion neurons and they are connected by synapses. So these synapses transmit electrical or electrochemical signals between neurons. One, when one neuron fires to the next neuron, if, if, if it is sufficient input, the next neuron fires forward. So it results into a chain of reactions that we call cognition. So all of our thoughts, all of our reasoning, memories, and the results um, of, of are, are the results of the neural network. So it is fascinating that today we can replicate all of these things uh, on, on machines and here we have an abstraction uh, layer that we call it software right so software helps us um, uh, implementing into machines the the, the, the replicate the, the cognition now uh, on on machines the neural networks aren't just a component of artificial intelligence i think they are it's beating hard so uh, they've helped us revolutionize the way we uh, and the approach we uh, process uh, data and uh, uh, brought us closer than ever to replicate the intricacies on, on, um, uh, of the human brain in a machine. So what is truly fascinating, I think, uh, is how this neural uh, network uh, draw inspiration from the, from the human brain uh, network, uh, neural network structure. So. 
By attempting to mimic the human brain, we've unlocked levels of data processing or and sophistication that were previously unimaginable. Uh, but as we stand at the, at the fair front of these advancements, it is crucial for us, especially as engineers, to reflect on some, uh, some pressing, some outstanding questions, such as who is who, who develops AI further, right? Who uh, is at the helm of AI development and how do we as engineers uh, decide on the architecture of these neural networks? And importantly, what challenges uh, are we yet, uh, yet to overcome uh, in, in this domain? So understanding uh, neural network, it's, it's not only uh, an academic aspect, it's, it's something that uh, it's the essence of our digital future. Let's contrast now two paradigms in, in, paradigms in, in, the, real, uh, in the realm of computer, computing. Sorry. So we, we have the traditional software development and we have on the other hand, the machine learning approach, right? You know that traditional software which probably is, is more familiar already to most of you, it is rule-based. So it requires explicit logic. Uh, it, it's, it is more deterministic. It cannot basically learn. The data is static and it, it's structured. So the best way we can make it more adaptive is using data structures and algorithms based uh, on some clauses, or we can have some, uh, some um, conditional statements, or we can have some loops, for example, right? Uh, but what do we have uh, for new, what do we do in the new situations? In the new situations that, that, uh, that our software is not prepared for, we have what we call exception handling, for example, right? Or we can have a mechanism of fallback. We have some like retrial mechanisms. We have timeouts. We have monitoring or alerts that are calling for, um, uh, for human uh, intervention. Uh, of course, we cannot deny that there are, uh, these are not smart methods, but these have their own strengths, but also their limitation. When the new situation pop up, uh, we sometimes new, uh, need more than, more than this. So we need a more dynamic and data driven approach. Uh, let's take an example of, of the ending of the game of chess or, uh, deciphering the DNA code, or let, let's say, for example, finding the pattern for the prime numbers, right? So in such situations, we usually do not know, uh, and I hope I, I'm answering your question, uh, Samudra. So in these situations, we actually do not know the pattern. That's, that's the problem we want to solve, uh, to find the pattern, right? So these are the cases when we need more data-driven approach, the techniques more adaptive, more adaptive, more probabilistic that have the, the logic more, more implicit. So this is the field of machine learning, which is a significant area or, or, of artificial intelligence. Um, uh, now, so we, we can, we can uh, basically conclude that we have two camps, so the rule-based camp, which is traditional uh, software development. And, uh, we have the data-driven camp of, uh, uh, machine learning, right? Um, okay. So now let's try to understand what actually learning is. Uh, so I'm not going to give you any uh, formal definition today for learning. In fact, what is fascinating and, and interesting about the con this concept of learning itself is that you can learn what learning is. That's, that's interesting. So, and let's, let, let's, let's start thinking uh, about learning by avoiding, uh, avoiding the confusion with memorizing, right? I mean, when you learn a lesson at school, you don't just memorize it. Sometimes, some, something, sometimes, or most of the times, something else happens there. Uh, you, you are, you, you do more than storing the data. You create some other connections with your previous knowledge, right? So I believe the, the best way to understand what learning is, it's, uh, to play a game together. So it's, this is not a game that actually exists just created now. It is called binary blitz. And, uh, this is the moment when I'm inviting some, someone from uh, the audience to join me for, I don't know, two or three minutes to, to play this small game that will help us understanding what learning is. So let's start playing the game. Now, the, the, the rules are quite simple. I give you three numbers and then I, I, I tell you what is the result of these three numbers. You don't know the pattern. You don't, you don't know actually the, uh, 
uh, the rule. So for example, you, you have 0, 0, 1, the input and the output is 0. Would you think of a of a formula that gives you zero or the output? What's the what's the rule that generates the output here? Okay, someone said this is a binary operation. So what 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 the formula? It's binary or what? It's it's an and or 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 what? And it's an and. Okay, okay. So if it's a, okay, if it's an and, then zero and zero and one, it's it's the output zero. Okay. The next example is one one one. Is your formula still correct? It can be and or or also any. Okay, let's let's see the third example. That's good. We have one zero one, and the output is one. This is or. This is or. Yes. Okay. Let's see the fourth example. Is zero one one. What is now? This is and. Are you sure? Uh, yes, yes, I'm sure it's and only. We have four uh, inputs that we used to understand how the output behaves. Now, if I give you the fifth example, which is one, zero, zero, would you tell me what's the expected output? It's a combination, okay. Don't don't think too, too, too much of that. So I, I'll tell you the rule. Okay, so now the rule I was thinking of is actually you just take the first bit. You, you just ignore the rest of them. You, you consider the first one. If you have zero on the first bit, it's zero the output. If you have zero here, it's zero. If it's one here, the output should be one. This is this was the rule. So what we did here, it it's called supervised learning, right? So you need some examples in order to understand how the uh, what the relation between input and output. And thank you very much, uh, Kumar and uh, everyone for, for the interaction. Uh, this is important for, for, for the references. So the approach we had here is, is supervised learning. And based on that, we will build our neuron and our neural network, right? There are, of course, a lot of uh, types of, um, uh, of learning. Uh, but yeah, we, we just uh, started with this one, which is uh, more essential. It's helpful for us to understanding um, the further concepts. Okay, let's see how would we solve this in, um, how would, would we do this in, in the traditional uh, approach, in traditional software development. So an option is to write a method that basically takes the three input parameters and then test if they are one or zero and returns the first one, right? This is the method. I hope you, you can see on the screen, like it, it's, it's big enough. Uh, this can work. It's not the only way you can do that, but, uh, it's, it's not the only solution, uh, but it, it works later. If you decide to change your, uh, your rule, then you have to rewrite the entire code. You cannot make the, mm, this algorithm, you cannot make it, uh, to learn your, your new rule based on the inputs and outputs, right? So. You know, you know, is this AI, I mean, we did some decisions, we analyzed the inputs, we decided on, on output, but in reality, we actually did some like traditional software development approach of, of using if then else clauses, right? Uh, okay. Let's see, let's see left. How would we design, uh, our solution, uh, our architecture of the solution for this problem. So when we design a neural network we design it to fit the problem. There is no, no universal way to, uh, to do it. Right. So let's have a look at the problem. Now, the problem is we have three inputs, right? And then we have an output. What's in between is something that we call a neuron, right? It's up until now, it's similar with the traditional approach. Then let's see further, further. We have these inputs goes to, uh, to inside the neuron there. We take some decision and we, um, um, calculate the output based on the inputs, right? Now, uh, you, you could probably observe that. Okay. We, we had one, one, zero, the, the output was, uh, was one, right? You could probably observe that here, some of the inputs are more important than others. Some of them are contributing to the output more than the others. And we have to have some examples in order to understand that, right? So we, we are calling, <laughs> we are calling these, um, contributions of each inputs 
to the final output, we are calling them weights. So in our case, the first one the, that the first one that contrib the, the first input contributes 100% and the rest of them contributes zero. So this is what we need to make in order to uh, create uh, to make our uh, our uh, neuron learn. Um, so these contributions are as I, as I mentioned the contributions of, of each input. It's called weights, and as I said previously, the neuron fires a signal to the next neuron and if it has sufficient signal it fires forward so let's see now how the signal the input signal actually if it is sufficient or not let's see it first what it is the input signal so the input signal uh if you consider also the weights the, the how important is each is each one it looks something like this is the product is the sum of the products between the input and and the weights right Uh, wouldn't it be easier to just make the first character from the first input and just that one is, is it, yeah, it, it's, uh, you can do that, but later on, if you decide to change the rule, you have to make your system learn, right? So you have to actually understand on the go that inputs two, it's, um, uh, it's more important. So that's why you have to make this dynamic. You, you, you cannot make it like with, with a static logic. Now, let's go back a bit to the input signal. It looks like this. If you if you want a more mathematical um, uh, approach, it's like uh, the sum of products of between the inputs and weights. And uh, we also want to add something. We want, we want to add this guy. It's called bias. This allow you uh, our neuron to produce a more flexible outputs, which is not strictly tied to, to the to the inputs right because in some cases you have all of the inputs are zero so this will will cancel any anything on the output you want to have a bias every time because this is like you learn based on something you knew pre uh, previously the bias it's it's it, it's like in english the, the bias right uh even if it's wrong or correct it's something that you knew previously and based on that you build your further knowledge now let's see further what's happening inside the neuron. So based on the input signal, we want to calculate uh, the output. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, why this formula? Because this is the way, okay, I'll, I'll go back. This is the way you basically read the inputs and you uh, uh, you weight and them, right? So you, you make the product between the input and their, their weight. And then you, you can, uh, you, you you just create a sum of the uh, of the inputs. Now, if you want the uh, if you want the activation fun, uh, if you want the, the neuron to fire forward, you need to activate it, right? And what does it mean the activate the activation? Activation is something that is applies to the input and that gives us the output. So activation looks looks like this after you. You have, if you have a sufficient incoming signal, then the neuron will uh, fire forward. Otherwise, uh, it will not do anything. So, uh, this activation function a function is essential in machine learning in, in neuron uh, neural networks because it, it basically translates our input to the output. Uh, you, you can just take the the formula uh, for granted and um, you can analyze uh, forward, but uh, forward. But uh, it's it's quite reasonable that they are the sum of the of the, the the total input is the sum of the inputs and it's weighted right. Now, in our case, for our problem, we will use a special function which is called sigmoid function. And why do we use that? Because sig uh, sigmoid function looks like this. It has the codomain between zero and one, and uh, always more than zero, always less than one. So it basically helps us estimate the probability of the event because the probability is also, uh, uh, yes, I will, I will repeat the, uh, the relation uh, between uh, with activation function right now, actually. Look at the activation function. It is one over one plus um, uh, e to the minus x, where minus x is our input signal, right? So input signal, you know, looks like this, right? If you rewrite the formula, it looks like this. Now, 
the neural input you remember it is the sum of the uh, product of the inputs um, uh, with their own weights plus the bias right if you add the bias you, you obtain the the neural the, the the input of the neuron and now if you replace this uh, formula into this one so instead of neuron input you will get basically the output of the neuron which looks like this right so at this point uh, i think we can uh, we can switch a bit to the coding part so we can see uh, how the uh, how can we implement this uh, into code right so uh, just remember we have the neuron output this is the formula uh, if you if you want further we can discuss about uh, some details about uh, how we uh, choose this one right so going now to the code part uh, so the, the structure of the project looks like this i have a python folder here which contains the uh, python code uh, usually um, i will create some um, uh, graphics uh, with python uh, in src is the java code uh, no you don't you don't have to code you just just uh, you, you can just uh, uh, watch it and uh, see how how this is happening then further you can uh, uh, you can uh, get the code and practice uh, on yourself at home. Then, this is the Java code. This is the Python code. And here, under Java, we have, under resources, we have uh, the JavaScript part, which uh, I created some scripts to uh, help me did, uh, do some animations for you. Uh, I would kindly ask you uh, to ask on the, uh, on the chat only, uh, like, critical questions. Otherwise... Uh, uh, it will probably interrupt everyone uh, or to I, I have to, to be interrupted for uh, uh, answering uh, this um, and we'll uh, we'll probably stop the flow for the others. Okay, so how it looks like uh, how it looks like the, the project in in Java we have the POM XML file so we basically built a Maven project uh, based on Java 17. Here are the dependencies you can see them on Git. Uh, the project is based on uh, on Git mostly. Uh, in Python, we work with NumPy, TensorFlow, Matplot, and uh, uh, SkyKit, uh, SciKit um, libraries uh, to create some uh, graphics. And uh, in JavaScript, uh, I used D3 um, uh, a, a library for uh, for some animations. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see now. We have some helpers here, so we, we can start with with some uh, uh, some details about the implementation of uh, the implementations of the of the mathematical formula, right? So as I mentioned earlier, we have okay, we have the sigmoid function. So the sigmoid function, the activation function, it it it, it looks like this, right? So it's one uh, over one plus. Uh, e uh, to the minus x right here the uh, the input signal is uh, is our um, input to the sigmoid and uh, we will uh, uh, we will use it to uh, to pass it here in order to calculate to, to calculate the output right uh, further we have the derivative of, of the sigmoid i'll explain you further why do we need a derivative and some other concepts that we are coming back here let's see how the neuron looks like so uh, we have simple neuron example here and the simple neuron is our basically it's a java class that has a uh, certain number of inputs which is configurable it has uh it associated weights right it has a bias and it has a weight for that for, for that bias right and this is the constructor this is, is what we need uh, to know for now then the input signal as i mentioned earlier it's the product, right? Uh, is the product between weights and input values, right? So if we do the sum of the products, then we get this for loop here, which basically implements our um, uh, our mathematical formula. So we get at the end, we we did an addition, we do an addition with the bias, and we get the input signal. This is the uh, the input signal, and the activation function gets. Uh, as argument the input signal the activation function we choose to be 
Sigma is for today. And I, I uh, showed you in the math helper class how sigmoid looks like, right? Uh, okay. Let's go back now to our presentation. So this is activation function. It's not the only activation function that we can, that we can use. Uh, sigmoid is, is the one uh, that's like good for our uh, uh, case now, but uh, also softmax will use it further. There are also other alternatives, right? Okay. Another function that we um, uh, that we use is the loss function, right? So, what is the loss function? The, the it, it is also known as the uh, error or the cost function. This one helps us pre uh, calculate the the accuracy of the neural network. So we we basically take the predicted output, the expected output, and we we make the we calculate the deviation between them because. Uh, we want to know how wrong or accurate was our uh, um, our neuron at, uh, for for a certain um, uh, use case. Uh, yeah. So yeah, sure. We will have the, the Python code as well. Don't worry. Uh, but again, you will get the there is there is plenty of code. You will get the Git repo because uh, we cannot show the whole code in only ninety minutes today, right? Uh, Okay, so the uh, one of the formula for the uh, loss function is the mean squared error, right? This is, I mean, you can calculate the loss function in in uh, multiple ways. That the but but one of them is the uh, mean squared uh, error, and this is the formula. Now, if we go to the code, let's search for it. Uh, I think I, it's in the math helper actually. So it looks like. Wait. Uh, wait, wait. Uh, okay. So it looks like this, right? It's basically uh, the code implementation of the of the formula that uh, that I just uh, show on the screen. It's um, it's our loss function. It helps us understand how accurate it's our prediction, right? Okay. Next, it's the training part. So we have a saying in um, uh, we have a saying in Romania: repetition is the mother of learning. And this is the case also with um, uh, with uh, the machine learning and neural networks. In order to uh, make the neuron learn, you have to do some training, right? And how do we start? We start by assigning some random weights, and it's it's important to be random. Okay, let's go back to the code and see how we create a neuron. So the neuron looks like this. We have the constructor here. And here we have the method initialize waste, right? A waste, right? So in this, in this initialize weight, we have for each weight, a generate random weight um, function that gives us a random number between uh, minus um, uh, zero, uh, 0.5 and uh, uh, plus 0, 0.5. So this random weights gives us um, uh what uh, uh what we call also kind of a, a bias in real life because you cannot start with zero uh weights if you start with that your uh, network or your uh, neuron will not learn anything right and you will see further why so we first assign the random weights and uh just wait for this uh first first of all you just make a guess right you have an input uh, and the same way as we did in our game, you have three numbers, you have to predict the output. You, you just guessed initially, right? Then after you, you guess something, you calculate the loss. This is why you want to have someone, and this is in supervised learning actually, you, you have someone to uh, tell you how wrong you are because you know the expected, uh, the expected output, right? So based on that, you know What's the loss and you want to minimize it, right? And when you minimize it, you basically go back and adjust the weights. So when I gave you the fourth and the fifth example, uh, then uh, you basically reconsider everything you knew about the, the, the set of, that set of, the, of numbers, right? So this is how we... The, le the, the learning is actually happening by adjusting the weights. This is the, the magic. And what's important also is to do this in the loop, right? 
only once it's not uh, it's not enough you have to do it again and again and again in what we call it epochs right learning epochs it's the loop that helps us um, 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 adjusting the weights and minimizing the loss the smallest the loss is the uh, the better our accuracy is right so about adjusting the weights now it's it's uh, it's more uh, complicated um, uh, it's more complex uh, more more theory part here but uh, i'll just give you uh, a brief so adjusting the weights is pr basically the process of fine tuning the parameters of the neural network the parameters namely these parameters are nothing more than the weights and the bias right so for that we rely on calculating what we call the gradient of the loss of the function with respect to each weight, right? So the gradient is just a fancy, a fancy way to say the derivative uh, or the rate of the um, uh, change of our function. And this gradient will help us adjust the neuron weights and the bias to reduce the error. And this is what we actually want, right? Because the gradient measures how much the output of a function changes if you change something in the in the input even a little bit right so this is why uh it, it can be thought of a derivative uh, as a derivative of, of the function with respect to, to to its inputs right uh and this is exactly as i mentioned exactly what we need to see how we can change the input signal in order to affect the output and to minimize the loss right so in neural uh, networks uh gradients play a crucial role in the training process and particularly, particularly during the um, uh, the phase of what we call back propagation. So back propagation and is when you go back and adjust the weight, the, the the weights. In essence, after we determine how wrong the neural the neural network's prediction is, I mean the loss, uh, we use the gradient to adjust each weight uh, in the di direction. Of the dec to decrease the, the the error, right? So if the gradient is large, it means the, we need a small change in the weights, uh, we, uh, and this small change will drastically uh, affect the output. If it's small, then the weights doesn't affect the output so much, right? So um, the primary algorithm that we use to train the networks is gradient descent, right? Uh, okay. Now, uh, we also have what is called learning rate. So the gradient descent, it's, um, uh, it's a way, uh, um, uh, the learning rate is a way to find this gradient descent. And I will show you in, in, uh, in some Python code how we do that, actually. So let's go now to the Python code. And uh, let's take the example. We have uh, some plots functions here. We have the gradient first, right? So I took an, an example of a, of a function which is uh, x um, uh, x squared. Uh, wait, I think there is an issue with the interpreter. Yeah, yeah. this is the way we found the gradient descent. And this is what we call learning rate. I'm, I'm uh, uh, coming back to this. We use collab. Okay. Uh, okay. So here is how we, we find the, the gradients by using the learning rate. It's important to uh, fine tune the learning rate uh, not to be too small or too large because you have the chances to uh, to uh, miss the, the the local meaning, right? How learning rate works? Let me show you here in another example. So learning rate looks something like this. I I have some examples. I used a 0 0.01 learning rate, 0 0.1 and 0 0.9. So all of them, you can see the the this is like the the smallest one. It's more like it's more consuming, but uh, it, you reduce the chances of uh, of missing, like uh, of missing the minimum. With uh, with this one, you you can just like uh, it's it's better. With uh, zero nine, it's when you increase too much the learning rate, when you want to speed us too much uh, the process, you have the chance to uh, to miss some uh, some minimums, right? So this is how um, uh, learning uh, uh, rate works. And this is what's, what's important to uh, for us to use it. Okay, uh, do we only have just to plot it? Yes, you you just go to... Um, uh, so first of all, it's important after you take the code, you go here to project structure, 
or, or probably you work with PyCharm, but I used IntelliJ because I, I could incorporate here both um, um, uh, Java and Python and also JavaScript actually. All right, so in IntelliJ, I could work with them. And the minimum is important because uh, there, there is the point, as I, as I explained earlier, you want to find the rate of change of your function, right? So you go, you want to go against that that uh, that minimum, right? You, you use the gradient, you you find it, uh, and then uh, with with a respect for for the each input and with each weight, um, you you calculate uh, you calculate that. We can talk later, um, uh, just not to delay the uh, the others too much. Uh, please keep save it for the for the Q and A um, uh, session. So uh, after you you download the, the code, you go to the project structure, you go to ADK here, and uh, I I have some uh, JDKs. You can go to plus to set up the Python. Go add Python SDK and choose virtual environment, right? And create a uh, virtual environment. And then based on the file you have here, requirements, it will automatically, and if not, you can just go and uh, install the um, uh, the libraries, right? It will download uh, the the dependencies here in, in virtual environment. That's a best practice for using Python. Probably uh, most of you already know that. Those more experience with, uh, uh, with uh, Python coding, right? Okay, uh, now, uh let's do a small small recap and then we will see uh some more coding right let's go back to our slides and as a recap we have first to understand the problem and design the architecture uh initialize the waves with random values right and this is important because we don't want them to be zero we want to choose and implement the activation function which helps us fire for fires forward. We want to choose and implement the loss function. We want to make predictions. We want to calculate the loss. We want to calculate the gradient, adjust the weights based on gradients to minimize the loss. And finally make another prediction. And we make these uh, steps uh, from, uh, from five to nine in the loop and we call it training, right? Okay, let's see how we did that uh, for a neuron. So. A neuron looks like this, as I showed you previously. Uh, we have uh, the inputs, weights, bias, the, the weight, the constructor here. We have the formula to calculate the input signal. We have the activation function. Okay, let me uh, actually probably increase the fund. We have the, uh, uh, the initialization of the weights. We have a method to calculate the output based on the activation function. And we have a classifier because the output will be a double number, not an integer. We want at the end to have only zero or one, not a probability, right? Then we have the method to adjust the weights based on the gradient descent, right? Which is just the mathematical function implemented. And we have some uh, helpers to print our neuron, right? So uh, let's start the application now. So I'm starting the sprint application. Uh, so again, I'm using uh, some bridges be between the spring, uh, the spring application in Java to communicate with uh, the Python code and with the um, um, uh, JavaScript code in order to compute the parameters of the neuron or of uh, the neural network in Java and then pass them to uh, Python to do some uh, plotting or pass them to JavaScript to do some visualization, okay? Let's see how our neuron looks like. So we created the neuron. It has three inputs and the inputs have these weights, zero point, zero point, and the other one, where is the other one? Oh, it's here. Can you see it or I can increase it even more? Is it okay now, uh, Irina? Yes, it's much better, thank you. Okay, so, um, Okay, maybe, maybe I can, uh, okay, I can put it like this. It's easier to read. So then you have the, also the bias weight, right? So let's have a visual of this. So initially our neuron looks like this. So it has the weight for the first um, uh, neuron. 
right? Uh, the, the input, sorry, the weights and the random bias. All of them are, are random. Based on these random values, the neuron was able to make a prediction with 53% accuracy of the out, the, that the output will be one. But this is just a coincidence. Let's go back. Let's restart the application. And this will give us another neuron, right? It should take about three seconds to reinitialize the application. Okay. Let's move to the right. Okay. So let's see how our neuron looks like. Ah. Okay. So we have different parameters for weights and bias. Oops. Right. And it looks something like this. And now the prediction is 41. So it's another coincidence, but it is not able to uh, to recognize that the rule was uh, the first uh, the first input is the more important, right? So what can we do now is to do the the that loop that I mentioned earlier to do the training, right? So what we uh, what we have for the training, we go the code here in um uh, okay uh in a simple neuron and we have the training uh the training method which looks like this so uh if we want to train our um uh, our neuron first we make a prediction right and the prediction is actually the output of the neuron and then we adjust the weights right and in order to do this in a loop I'm calling this train method here, right? Train method based on the input data set and the expected outputs, right? And I do this in a, in a loop, right? So the loop, we call them epochs. The more epochs we have, the more uh, training the, uh, the neuron will get. And, uh, and please notice for this problem, we only need one neuron, right? We'll scale up later, but we need only one neuron. So uh here we we train we we do the training right we we do it in a loop for multiple epochs and this will basically adjust every time we call this method train it will go and it will adjust adjust our weights right and it will make basically it will make it learn more and more and more okay let's make uh this uh uh let's uncomment this uh uh, this method actually this this will give us probably too much uh, okay let's uh this will even give us probably too much uh verbose logging so i'm uh reverting it restarting the application and going back there so uh this is how the, the training uh works and i call the method train more epochs right so i'm calling this uh, method here in a uh, in a service uh where i'm connecting with uh with a python uh, uh python api the python api will get um will get our uh, our parameters and we'll, we'll do some plotting one sec so we have the input data set right is the exactly the same example that i give you or similarly right we have zero 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 one zero one zero this is our game basically so i give it i give it to it i, I pass to it five examples right and i tell always what I expect. For this one, I expect zero. For the third one, I expect also zero. For the last one, I expect one, right? So, uh, we can create this get educated neuron method and by using it, we can just uh, train the network and um, um, store the states here and then plot the states using python uh, api right let's have a look into the python api as well so the python api looks like this we basically take the neuron states which is a, a list of states of the neuron right the list of states on the neuron looks, looks like that it's a list of weights and bias weight right each neuron has these parameters right going back to this i create a file a json file I pass that, uh, I, I'm reading that file and I pass that file to the Python process here, right? And it looks like this. Calling the Python from a virtual environment with, uh, uh, to, to the script, net, uh, neuron evolution. And I'm, I'm passing, 
uh, I'm passing these uh, neuron states there. Okay, let's go back to the Python code now. Let's see how neuron evolution looks like. So it looks like this. We basically take the states, we load them from JSON, we read the weights and bias, right? We create lists and we plot them, right? Uh, we also, oops, uh, uh, we also have this loop here to for, for plotting the weights you, you will see in a moment, right? Uh, because this is important to see the evolution of the uh, of the weights over the, over the epochs, right? Okay, so going back now to our um okay like this going back to our animations we have worth the guess from the uh from for our neuron it's 41 uh, accuracy uh, actually it, it had some um uh 47 sorry it had some um uh training in between so if we do some epoch trainings. We can see it has initially it didn't learn anything after after some epochs, right? So we can see here we had 50 epochs of training, another 50, and that's it. So after 50 epochs of training, it didn't learn too much. We do another 50. And this time it increased the, the, the accuracy to 54% because the weights are adjusting. And you can see uh, after each series of 50 epochs, we increase the, the weights again, increase the weights. And you can clearly see that one gets more and more weight here. It's the difference is already huge, right? So let's, let's, let's show you what is epoch. So epoch is the number of uh, training steps that we execute right we we take the same inputs we give the same expected outputs and based on them we adjust the the weights and several times we after you do that you you call it a, an epoch right so uh initially okay the epochs, the, the difference between weights was like that after 100, uh, or ac actually, if you look here after 20 epochs, we had already, we, we knew that, uh, the weight, the first weight was bigger, right? Than the others, but look at the last phase after 250 epochs, the difference was already huge, right? I mean, it didn't even look at, um, uh, weights two and three and moreover. It, it was computing it really close to zero, a bit, a, a bit maybe more than zero, but uh, around zero. So it's it's almost. I don't look into that, right? If I go, I have here. We can we can repeat the exercise if you if you want. So we have a um, um, a configuration, a global config uh, class here that tells us how many epochs do we want to train the uh, the neuron and let's say instead of 50 let's let's say 500 right then uh, what's happening okay so we have 500 epochs let's run it again It should take about 10 seconds to start the spring up. So this builds and loads, uh, uh, JavaScript code and, uh, also the spring application and, uh, the Python code. That's why it takes like about maybe five seconds. Uh, okay. So initially th this is the state of our neuron. Initially it is 0, 049. So quite close, but it's just a coincidence. This is what neuron, our neuron knows about, um, uh, uh, with, with a random weight, right? And after 1000, let's see, this is from the previous state. After 1000 epochs of training, it goes to 0 0.75, right? So it, it, it definitely learned from 0 0.49, which was random to 0 0.75. If I choose, probably if I choose 
3,000 or something like that. Okay, let's let's try with 5,000 and restart the app. If I, okay, let's. If I choose probably 10 times more training, uh, we will definitely see that it will go somewhere close to 100%. So our neuron will be almost sure that 100% is... Um, the, the, the first input is important, right? Uh, Lucian, can I ask you meanwhile, uh, when you were showing the graph uh, how uh, the weights are changing during the amount of epochs, yeah. Uh, why um, weights for input two and three doesn't didn't stop at zero uh, when they don't influence the output uh, in any epoch? Okay, let me try with five thousand. Let's see what happens. Okay, so the initial uh, the initial um, status here is zero point fifty six. Okay, we were lucky. Let, maybe let's not restart the application. L luckily, it it just already right. Now after one uh, five thousands, you can see the difference. It's zero thirty one, right? And it's quite close to one. It's ninety ninety one percent, and it looks like this. What you can see here, it is that this was the, were the initial states of the weights. This one, the weight one was increased tremendously, right? And though the other ones are almost 0 031. Um, at some point, after probably what we have here, probably 100 epochs, our algorithm didn't optimize anymore the weights two and three. That's what ha what it happened. And here we have to do some fine tuning. If you want, we can probably go and um, we can probably go and adjust this uh, to make it zero if you really want to. But the difference is quite significant. I think it's like it's reasonable that after five thousand um, epochs, we have ninety-one percent accuracy. Now, if you want to um, have even more accuracy, you have to uh, you have to play with with these things. You have to play with learning rate. This is what I what I choose. But uh, let's take uh, if we take for example zero point nine, right? You will see something like this. learning rate, right? So you will probably miss some of them. It will probably learn even uh, worse than it does, right? If you choose, uh, if you choose different, okay, let me close this. If you choose different learning rate, it will behave differently. Then if you choose a uh, different bias, because when I initialize the neuron, uh, this is my neuron. This is the initialization, right? Initialize weights. I'm initializing the bias. So, and I'm initializing with values like this, right? Between, uh, okay, let's, let's do an, uh, a small exercise. Let's use just a random and let's see how this impacts our, uh, the behavior of our application, right? So we have to do fine tunings with all of this activation function. Maybe choose something else. Um, uh, loss function, choose something else. Um, uh, learning rate, choose something else. Right? You have to choose them wisely, and that's the that's the interesting part. There is no universal uh, algorithm to to do that. Right? Uh, I I yeah I forgot to show how it was initially, but after after five thousand, it has again. Okay, look at this. So they are not anymore 31, they are 38. They, so this time, after fine tuning, um, after fine tuning the, the parameters, it, it went even worse, right? So I did some 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 bad, uh, because like I probably uh, set the, the weight where I was uh, not lucky enough to have a good weight from the beginning, right? It also depends on what the, the initialization uh, works for you. It also depends on the data set. Now you can also go, we probably don't have time for this now, but what we, what else we can do is go here, uh, on the train, uh, okay. On the training service and we can, we can give 
like the data set, we can use all of this, right? If you give them, if you give it to it, all of these examples, there will be nothing new for, for it. And it will immediately, instantly, uh, will guess with high, high accuracy and we will adjust correctly the weight, right? That's how it, it, it behaves. I tested that, but it, it takes time now. You can uh, take the code and, uh, and write, and uh, we can discuss uh, further about this. So this is how neuron basically learns, right? Um, okay. By adjusting the weights, this is where, where the magic happens again, and it's quite fascinating things. Now, let's see what happens if we have some more complex uh, patterns, right? And the more complex pattern, I uh, took the example of uh, handwriting. So it's it's an art as, as like all civilization itself is deeply personal. Each handwriting, each character is quite unique, right? It has unique blends, unique curves, unique slants, pressures, and so on, right? So it's it's really complicated to um, uh, to understand the, the handwriting and and to to make like to to make the the, the neuron understand these patterns. Let's take an example now, and it will probably be easy for you as human agents, right? If you see this one, uh, you, you'll probably tell me that that's a two for, for sure, right? Quite easy. Then if you see the other one, you will say, okay, it's, it's still a two. If you see this one, you will uh, also guess that it is a two as well, right? So uh, the difference between them, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite huge, right? So now we want also to find some functions, some activation functions, some loss functions. We want also to find some algorithms to adjust our weights with the respect for each input um, pixel here uh, and to, to tell to our neural network how important is this pixel for my uh, final understanding on, on the handwriting, right? We will choose just just for the simplicity. We will choose only numbers from zero to nine. It's like too much to understand the characters and so on in just one hour. But zero, zero to nine, it's it's quite um, uh, good um, uh, good practice, right? So let's see how we approach this problem. We have the architecture of um, uh, the neural network first, and there are like uh, tons of architecture that you can you can choose. We will use for our example feed forward neural networks, right? Uh, right? And it is, uh, yeah, it is like computer vision if you want, <laughs> but it's like, it's like, this is the basics of computer vision. You are, you understand some images, right? Let's see how we do that. We choose this architecture. I also emphasize the transformers architecture, which is really popular. This is used to um, create uh, large language models such as ChatGPT, for example, right? Okay. So, Let's see how we make our own. Yeah, are we doing with M N I S T Tudor? Yeah, you're right. So let's see how we do our um, architecture first. On M on this library, uh, we have 28 to 28 input images. I mean, uh, 70, uh, 784 neurons input parameters, right? And for the output, we have. 10 possible results, so we'll have 10 neurons, right? Now, what we want to do is to insert somewhere, something in between in order to obtain our um, uh, our network, right? So right now, the network looks something like this. Uh, let me see, I think, yeah. So our network looks like this, basically. It has three inputs, the neuron and the output, right? So. What can we do is to scale this a bit. So as I said, we have here the global config file and we can go, go scale this. How many neurons? We have 784. So this means uh, an image of 28, 28 pixels. We have two hidden layers and we have 16 neurons per hidden layer. Okay. What are these hidden layers? So the hidden layers are basically uh, helping us to increase the depth of the neural network because they are they creating they are creating more interconnection between neurons and more synapses and this is why we actually call deep learning the more hidden layers we have 
uh, the deep, the deeper will be our uh, neural network and the learning itself, right? Okay, I think uh, uh, we have about 15 minutes or 20 minutes to go, right? Uh, probably it will uh, uh, it will be like uh, ready in about 10 minutes the presentation, and then we can continue with the, with the questions. Okay, so let's see now with this uh, new uh layers how our neural ne uh, neural network uh, looks like so we have 784 inputs we have two uh layers of neurons now so we basically took exactly the same neuron exactly the same activation function but the difference is each neuron here has all of these neurons as inputs right this each of these has all of these as inputs and now the output shouldn't be only 0 or 1, right? So we want to go and scale this as well. So I'll make it 10, right? So this time, uh, we will get the final shape of our the final architecture of our um, of our um, neural network that, that looks something like this. Okay, give it a second. It's not as heavy as it may look, but... Um, I, I, I probably have too many things open on the laptop now. Okay. Uh, it still did not start. Okay. Next tools. Okay. It's ready now. Okay. So this is how our, our network looks like. In, at, at this point, we have two layers, 10 outputs, right? From zero to nine. And we want to see how, ma how can we uh, uh, fine tune the, the parameters here, the weights here in order to activate this Mm, neurons in order to obtain the output, right? So, uh, let me help you understand first how we convert, how we make the transition between between this simple use case. We have one zero zero. How we make the transition to a more complex use case? So we take basically this number. It's number two here. Uh, I didn't draw it for uh, twenty eight to twenty eight pixels because it's like it's just too large for the screen. But just consider consider this scale, right? So you have the image and you take the image. First, you, you are flattening the image like this, right? And then you are transpose the flattening vector like this. So this way you obtain 784, 28 to 28 uh, images it trans, uh, transposing and translating to this, which are actually this layer of neural, right? Uh, okay, let me... Uh, let me check now. So in order to uh, to see how our neural uh, behaves now, we can do a test, right? So we can create an input image right here. We have, let's, let's write a two, for example. Okay, it's, it takes a while because it's quite big image. Yeah, non-linear activation I mentioned uh, earlier for this problem. Uh, one sec. Okay, this probably doesn't look exactly like a good tool, but whatever. Uh, let's have a quick look on the on how our neural network looks like actually before checking how it works. So we have a different package here, neural network. We have first the neuron, which is exactly the same as the previous one. But I added actually this one, which stores the error per each neuron, right? It's delta. Uh, it's, it's another parameter. Then we have a layer and each layer looks, looks like this. Layer, it's an array of neurons basically, right? Uh, and um, when we create a layer, we basically uh, initialize each neuron, uh, each weight on each neuron uh, with random values, right? We then have some uh, some uh, helper methods such as create hidden layers, create uh, the layout of hidden layer, create output layer, and so on. These are not like core uh, logic here. What is more important is what we have in the neural network class, right? So neural network looks like this. It has the input vector, which is this, this one, right? It has the hidden layers, which is the list of layers right? Because we have two, one, two, we can have more. 
like it's a list. We have the output layer, which has a layer with like just 10 neurons. And we have two other elements that store the outputs uh, for each, each side, hidden layer and output layer, right? The outputs are this one. Currently, none of these uh, net, uh, neurons are activated. So they, are, they have like zero value for output. When they are activated, they will have more than uh, 0 0.5, I mean, more than 50% probability. So they, they will gain some colors, right? And you will see which one is active in the network, which one is it doesn't, right? This is how we initialize the neural network. We basically create uh, the input vector in case it doesn't have anything, uh, we generate uh, random. I mean, actually we generate random for the beginning, we generate random of everything. And then we came, we come, and we do some adjustments such as calculate the network outputs. And here, when we calculate the network outputs, we basically calculate the outputs for each layer, right? Inside this, this calculate outputs, uh, oh, sorry, not here actually. Uh, okay, one sec, I have to go back. Okay, we have the, the method backpropagation. So here, this backpropagation looks, uh, means that we first calculate the error per each neuron, and then we do the backward propagation. That means calculate the gradient for each weight for each neuron and adjust the weight, right? Uh, okay, so let's see how the training looks for, um, uh, for this neural network. Okay, one sec. I have to go back and restore this uh, passage here. One moment. I did some changes right before the another demo, but uh, they are not important anymore at this point. Okay. So the training looks like this for the neural network. Uh, and I think I'm answering it to the uh, team of questions, right? Uh, so it's, it's like similar uh, for our neuron. We basically do the training in multiple epochs, right? We set the vectors, uh, the input vector, which with our training data, the, which is hand, handed uh, manually, then we have, we do the predictions and we, after we do the predictions, we calculate here, we calculate the, the errors and we do pro back propagation and adjust, adjust all the weights and adjusting all the weights looks like this. So it's basically exactly the same thing for uh, one neuron, but we are calculating the output per each, per each layer here. So we have a for loop. And then use the same method of adjusting the weights inside the for loop per neuron, right? And at the end of the layer, we switch the input vector with the next, uh, the, the next input vector. I mean, for this layer, this is the input vector. For this layer, the outputs of this are the input vector, right? The outputs are zero for the beginning, right? Okay. So, uh, we also have some methods to save some, some, uh, you know, some helpers to save mm, to JSON and to load from JSON the, the models because we want basically to save the model itself, right? So let's see how our uh, network looks like in the beginning. And then let's do some, yeah, let's do, let's do a prediction first. So this is a two. Uh, okay. Where is that? Okay, so it's predicted as a weight, as, as a eight, sorry. Can you see now? It thinks it is a weight, uh, an eight, sorry. So what I can do, I can teach my uh, network how this is not an eight, actually, how this is a two, right? So what I did, I set a training set size of 300 is too much. It takes too much for our presentation, but I uh, I can take only 10 images from the MNAIST uh, library. And then I, I tell it that I want only tools, only images with two, and I train the network against those images, right? So let's restart this.
we are almost there. So this is the last uh, demo arena. I know we are approaching the end of the time uh, or end of our session. So for those that are curious, you will uh, you will see now the the weights updates for all the neurons in our network. So let's do the prediction again. We start with two. Oh, we predicted two already. Okay, we were lucky actually. This time it it was like pure luck. Let me start over. It's a bad coincidence. I, I don't want to re redraw this one because it takes also time. So we need a, a wrong guess. This is, I mean, it, it can be uh, a, a good coincidence, but um, uh, that that doesn't help us, right? Okay, let's do another prediction. So you think it is a five now, right? Then we have 100 epochs and we uh, train the network 100 epochs against 10 images of two. Right, so let's see how that goes. We call the train method. So it ended 100 epochs quite smoothly. You can you can choose with uh, all of the numbers, but I uh, uh, I choose only number two. And this is the graphic. So this is how much it learned about number two after like. Okay, here I have thirty thousands. Um, uh, steps actually, because each epoch has 100 or something like that, right? You do the math. So we use the same, but um, uh, yeah, I, I could use the ReLU. As I, as I mentioned uh, earlier, so there are uh, a lot of other, uh, I, okay, I, can, I should go back too much probably, but activation functions here, right? So they are there are multiple cho uh, choices. I, I just prefer to use that one just for the simplicity of the, of the code and uh, and our details. Okay, so now let's see uh, what's the prediction after this amount of training. So now it predicts it, it's a two. The prediction is two, and uh, let's see how the network looks like after prediction. So now it, it took this input, it converted all of these pixels into a, into a vertical vector, like it, like it did here, right? So it converted like this and then like that. And then activated these neurons. And at the end, after 30,000 uh, epochs, it is 100% that it's two. Even if 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 it looks quite badly, right? <laughs> so yeah, that's that's how how it, it works. Uh, now, uh, our network, our architecture, it's called fully connected because we have eight hundred two neurons in total, but only forty two have activation functions. The input layer has, uh, I mean, the the, the um, number of connections between input layer and the first hidden layer is this one and then we have other parameters other connections and weights between each layer in total our uh, architecture has 30,000 more than 30,000 only for this simple use case more than 30,000 parameters that's what you probably heard always on, on the news uh, chat gpt has this uh, much parameters right and i give you some facts about uh, uh, most popular um, neural networks so ChatGPT, for instance, for example, or GPT-4 has 1.76 trillion, right? We have only 30,000 here. And uh, an interesting fact is after 775 million, the parameters start learning by, the, by themselves to uh, use tools, such as you give them a, a game, such as, I don't know, chess, for example, and it, can, it can start learning uh, like without super, supervision necessarily. A very rough estimation, it's like human brain has about 600 trillion, but it is not like, it's a very rough estimation and it doesn't work like that in human brain. But I just want to emphasize that the number of parameters is not, not always the most important, the only measure. It's also the architecture that is very important, right? 
So for the future, we have like a lot of other challenges in uh, neural networks, such as um, uh, creating general AI with neural networks, such as um, creating continual learning or brain computer interfaces. Most of them probably will be uh, relying on uh, different neural network architectures, right? Here is some history. Uh, just wanted to emphasize that uh, this is not from uh, like uh, since ChatGPT um, arised. Uh, it's 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 been studying for a uh, few decades already, like more in depth uh, since forties. Um, uh, uh, but uh, only in the past two decades, deep learning with with this architecture of hidden layers um, was uh, was more prominent. Here you can have and you uh, will will send you this um, uh, will send you this um, uh, PDF or with this presentation. Here you have some URLs that can help you to uh, learn more about uh, this topic and uh, the online resources uh, on uh, GitHub. This repo is very interesting um, collection of uh, free materials, free learning materials about artificial intelligence and neural networks. So. Basically, that was my presentation for today. Uh, now we can uh, stay a few more minutes if you want uh, to discuss about neural networks and artificial intelligence. Uh, I can uh, give you like some heads up why I am passionate. Uh, I'm interested in neural networks because they basically exhibit superior abilities such as learning uh, that are not uh, uh, present in uh, each com component com uh, if they are not combined. I mean, a, a, a network can learn, but like really small things, but when you combine them, you can achieve great things, right? And there are a lot of complex philosophical questions that are involved uh, here. And uh, yeah, this is why I'm mostly interested in neural networks.